All right, well, you have your Bibles open, I hope, to the book of Psalms. That's where we've been. We've been spending some time the last, I guess, five weeks in the book of songs, book of poetry that reflects real life. And we've looked at the first two Psalms. We've looked at Psalm 103 and Psalm 105. We looked at Psalm 42 and 43. So today we're at Psalm 140. And we're going to be reading that together. And I realize we all come with different translations of the Bible. So in a moment, I'll put it up on the screen so we can all verbally read that together. But I encourage you to have your Bibles. A couple things I just want to remind you of that we've talked about already. This is Hebrew poetry. The book of Psalms is Hebrew poetry. But it doesn't rhyme necessarily. It doesn't necessarily have the rhythm that we had normally think of, but what it has is parallelism. That's a truth that's repeated in a different way, uh, sometimes with a different emphasis to make a point. So as we read this scripture together, look for parallelism. Also, Masami pointed out in many of the Psalms, we see the name, the personal name of God, and we just sang a song about it. What is God's name? Yahweh. Yahweh. All right. And so look for Yahweh in this passage, and we recognize it in most of our Bibles when it's Lord, L-O-R-D, is in all caps. That's the, the, um, how the translators have captured that Hebrew word Yahweh. One more thing before we read. This psalm introduces us to the word Selah, S-E. L-A-H. It's used 71 times in the book of Psalms. It's also used in the book of Habakkuk. And the best understanding of this word selah is it's a musical term that means pause, rest, reflect, think. As if you know music, music is full of rests or pauses, and they become very important. Some think it might be better understood, this word sila, as an interlude, where maybe the musicians continue to play, but the singers are quiet to reflect. You'll notice, even in that last song, that our musicians sometimes do an interlude, where the, the uh, instruments play, we don't sing. Why do we do that? It's not so they can highlight their excellent musical skills. That's not the purpose. The purpose of an interlude in our worship setting is so we pause and we reflect on what we just sang. We think about it as that music continues to play. So, as we stand to read this psalm together, when we see the word selah, we're going to pause before we continue to read. So will you stand together with me, please? This is Psalm 140. The superscription says, For the choir director, a psalm of David. Let's read it together. Rescue me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who devise evil in their hearts. They continually stir up wars. They sharpen their tongues as a serpent. Poison of a viper is under their lips. Selah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to trip up my feet. The proud have hidden a trap for me, and cords they have spread a net by the wayside. They have set snares for my feet. Selah. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Give ear, O Lord, to the voice of my supplications. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not promote his evil device that they not be exalted. Selah.
As for the head of those who surround me, may the mischief of their lips cover them. May burning coals fall upon them. May they be cast into the fire, into deep pits from which they cannot rise. May a slander not be established in the earth. May evil hunt the violent man speedily. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. The upright will dwell in your presence. Father God, we thank you for this portion of your word that you've preserved for us. Holy Spirit, please teach us today. Take your truth. Lord, move it through our ears and our eyes and even to our hearts. Transform us even today because of the truth of your word. In Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Selah. We saw it three times. How did you do with that pause? How did you do with that silence? Was it awkward? A little bit uncomfortable? <laughs> Have you noticed that there is constant 24-7 background noise in our lives? Well, maybe it's not always there, but it's certainly available to us. We always have some sort of stimulus coming to our ears. A lot of us walk around with those earbuds in our ears at work, in our spare time, as we're going around the house. We, we have the television on at home, even if we're not watching. We have the radio going everywhere we go when we drive, or music coming through all those devices. I wonder if we do that sometimes just to avoid sila, just to avoid the silence just to avoid the pause. I was reading a study this week, 580 undergraduate students uh, taken over six years, um, and it said that this constant accessibility and exposure to background media has created a mass of people who fear silence. I think we do. I, I, I think that we just don't like having silence in our lives because of what we might think about or where our minds might go. I don't think we do well at silence and contemplation. Another quote said, more than money, power, and even happiness, silence has become the most precious and dwindling commodity of the modern world. Certainly dwindling, but I don't know if how in our minds how precious it is. not the main point of the passage. I just want to encourage us to at times find silence. Tomorrow morning when you go to work, what if you drove to work in silence, thought, and even listened? Find some time in your day to just sit and be quiet, not necessarily listening to music, not necessarily listening to another message, and I realize many of you do that, and that's, of course, a good thing to hear God's word in our lives, but sometimes we just need silence. Consider that. It seems to be a part of Scripture that is brought to us that we need to consider. So let's dig into this text. Did you see the parallelism? It's not readily obvious, but it's right at the beginning of the psalm, and if I put those first four or five verses up on the screen together, with a little bit of color, I think you see the parallelism very clearly. You can see that in verse 1, he makes a statement, comes back again in verse 4. In verse 3, making the statement, comes back again in verse 5, and says it just a little bit differently. And so you see that he says, rescue me, keep me. He talks about violent men and evil men and wicked men. He talks about stirring up wars and making traps and their tongues are poison and sharp. 
So we see similar repeated phrases. If we put that next screen up again, I just highlight some of those things. That in the two different portions of Scripture, he repeats similar ideas a little bit differently because he's trying to make a point. The poetry is being used in that parallelism to make a point for the reader or even for the singer or for the one that's listening to the song. So the question then becomes, what is the point? What's the point of the parallelism, of the repetition? The point is, evil is present. Evil people are real. He's making it clear that violent people are present. People who are bent and intent on evil. And by the way, he says this, this violence is not somewhere off in the distance. It's not some vague, faceless entity. It's near him. It's around him. It's even after him. It's surrounding him. Now the superscription at the beginning of this psalm says it's of David meaning it's either written by David or about David. So if we look at David's life, we see the reality of this scripture very clearly. And we don't know all the details that he's referring to or that is being referred to in this passage, but even if we just look kind of as an overview of David's life, it could be a reference to King Saul, who when David was anointed to be the king, Saul's anger and Wrath came down on David. And he was bent on destroying David. It could be that these words are a reflection of a time in David's life when his own son, Absalom, tried to take his throne and spoke evil about his father in order to dispose him. It could be it's a reference to another son, Adonijah, who tried to turn the people against David. Not once, but twice. It could be a reference to Joab, David's military leader, who at times was disgusted with David and spoke that very clearly. It could be mentioned to a man named Doag or Shiva, or as you look back through the pages of the Old Testament, you see these were people in David's life that seemed to be intent, at least at times, on bringing David down. People intent to harm, intent on evil. Using words to their advantage, using words to poison people. So all of that to say what we're reading in this passage is not some vague reference to evil people that David doesn't know anything about. This is a reference to specific people, while we don't know exactly who they are, who, had, who, who David had it experienced. These words are personal. They're words that are heartfelt. They're not theoretical references to evil out in the world, but practical words, real words about his life and his experience. So because of that, he can speak very uh, directly and even detailed about what this evil looks like. And so as you again dig into this passage, there's a couple things he highlights. He says these evil people, says they devise evil things in their hearts and they continually stir up wars. These are people whose hearts are intent on conflict. They're intent on harm. They don't want good. They continually stir stuff up. They continually stir up wars. And that was a very literal thing that was happening to David. These people in his life were continually stirring up wars around David that David had to fight. These people don't like it when things are calm or at peace. They thrive on conflict. They strive on discontent. They strive on disunity, and they love to quarrel. There are people like that, are there not? In our community, in our neighborhoods, of course in our nation, no doubt in your life as well. Another characteristic of these people that David points out is that their words are hurtful 
and destructive and deceptive. And it gives this very vivid image in verse 3. They sharpen their tongues as a serpent. Poison of a viper is under their lips. It's interesting, this is actually one of five times that the, the psalmist, David, writes about people's words as being sharp. Let me just show you all of those, and, and I won't take the time to read them all, but it talks about like a sharp razor. The tongue is a sharp sword. They literally spew out swords from their mouth. Their tongues are like swords, like deadly arrows. Now, I just want to be quick to say it's one thing to be pointed in our speech. Sometimes we need to be very pointed and direct. But the people with an evil intent use their words not to be pointed and direct for good, but to be pointed and direct to the point of destruction. And their words are very deceptive. Proverbs 12, 11 says, There is one whose rash words or like thrusts of a sword. Have you ever had those thrusts of a sword in your life? People say things that it, it, you even experience it physically. As soon as you hear the words, it's like, ah, oh, that hurts. We have all experienced that. And often by people very close to us, which makes it even more hurtful. And again, understanding that David, as he's writing, he's writing about most likely everybody that has done this that has been very close to him, his own sons, King Saul that, that he tried to minister to. Now, we would hesitate to call these people evil at times, especially if they're very close to us. And at times we have to admit their words have an evil impact on us. It's very destructive. So we begin this passage with this very vivid parallelism that points to the reality of evil, not a distant, faceless evil, but evil that encroaches in our lives and the characteristics of that. It's not a real happy message so far, is it? What do we do with that? That's the question. We know that's true. We read it in Scripture, but we even know that to be true in our lives as evil has impacted us in different ways. It's not a real happy truth necessarily, but it is an important truth, amen, to recognize that it's there. But the question begs to be answered. What do we do with that? Back when I used to work for a living, I worked outside. I worked outside, often on roofs, all year long. And I remember in the months of like January and February, waking up every morning, listening, is it raining outside? Because I know if it's raining outside, I just had to go out and get on a roof and work in that rain. And it was all I could do to just pull the covers over my head and just wish it would go away so that I didn't have to get up and go out into that. Do you sometimes feel like that in our world? You look at it, you just want to cover up, stay warm, stay dry. Stay protected. Lord, could you just make it all go away? Now, we may feel like that. I think we all do at times. But that's not the option. It's not an option we have. Any more than it was an option for me to just pull the covers over my head. It had to be done. You had to go out into it. Christians, though, have tried throughout the centuries to isolate to insulate, to separate, to segregate, to just pull the covers over our heads to protect ourselves from all the evil that's out there. But I point out from the very beginning in that whole idea that that's certainly not the example that Jesus gave us, is it? Who came to the world. 
in flesh and faced that evil in a very real way. So the point the psalmist is making is real. It's a practical reality, but the answer then is not to avoid the reality, to try to escape it. Obviously, we must face it. There's something I read this week, and <clears throat> maybe you have as well, and it's attributed to many people. I'm not sure who said these words first, but I think they're very applicable today. Somebody said, people are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. When do you spend your years creating? Others could destroy it overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give the best you have anyway. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. I love where that goes because that's exactly where the psalmist goes. After he comes face to face and presenting this, vi this very vivid picture of what evil is like and evil people are like, he brings us not to focus on that but on God because it's really about us and God anyway. Amen? If we focus our attention on evil and all the evil people, the result of that is that we tend to cower and cover and shrink back and stop doing all the things that God has placed us here to do. But if we focus on the Lord, then we have a completely different response. So look at these next three verses. <clears throat> Notice the change of focus. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Give ear, O Lord, to the voice of my supplication. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. You have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not promote his evil device that they not be exalted. Do you see God's name there anywhere? How many times? Four times. Four times God, or um, the psalmist uses the personal name of God. Four times he turns his attention to the Lord instead of the evil. And I want you to notice as we walk through this that each time he mentions that, it's like another aspect of God, his God, that he can cling to and find confidence in. First of all, he says in verse 6, I said to the Lord, you are my God. You see, the psalmist looks at Yahweh and he says, Yahweh, you are my God. You're a very personal God. You're not just the God of my forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh, you are my God. Not just the God of my parents. I want to remind us all that God has no grandchildren. He only has children. He's not just the God of my grandparents. He's not just the God of my spouse or the God of my friends. He says, God is my God in a very personal way. Not a distant God that rules from space, not the, the big guy upstairs, but a personal God that has invaded space and time to interact with people personally. And David had experienced that. In the 23rd Psalm, you, under, you know that Psalm well. Uh, the, sa the Psalm says, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. 
And then he goes on to talk about that personal interaction with the shepherd in his life. And of course, that analogy goes into the New Testament where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. He's very intimately acquainted with his sheep. The prophet Isaiah introduces the name Emmanuel to us in Isaiah chapter 7. And Emmanuel means what? God with us in a very personal way. Is that your God? In a personal way. He goes on in this next phrase. He says, give ear, O Lord, to the voice of my supplications. We see the psalmist looks at Yahweh personally as one that's very attentive. Give ear, O Lord, listen to me. And I don't sense that he's, he's somehow clamoring to get God's attention. He's saying, God, you're attentive to me. Listen. I'm probably sure you've seen seen it where there's parents and this little toddler trying really hard to get the parents of the get the attention of the parents and they're pulling on the legs and they're they're raising their hand and they're jumping up and down and the parents are oblivious to it. No doubt I've been like that at times with my children. Trying to get the parents to listen. And yet Yahweh A personal God is always attentive. We always have his ear. He's never preoccupied. He's never distracted. God doesn't have a problem multitasking, all right? He does it all at the same time perfectly. In Psalm 34, 15, look at this. It says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Understand what he's saying. He's always looking at us, and he's always listening to us, and he's able to do that with all of us in a very personal way all the time. Psalm 139 says he is intimately acquainted with all of our ways. Intimate, personal, attentive. Tonight in our Marriage Matters class, the topic is communication. I know that none of us have problems in communication and marriage, right? (laughs) It's interesting as I just have been thinking about that in relationship to the class tonight. The, The problem is not so much even having time to communicate, but it's actually giving undivided attention in communication and actually listening deeply to what is being said. We work at that at our marriage. Can I just tell you that God is our Father? doesn't have to work at that. Every time we approach Him, He's listening intently at not only just the words we're saying, but what's coming from our hearts. Because He's very personal, and He's very attentive. And David seemed to recognize that. As we continue on, the psalmist looks at Yahweh also is very as sovereign and powerful. We, he, we see there it says, O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. Let me just camp there for a little bit because it's an interesting combination of God's names, two Hebrew names for God. Right in that verse we have Yahweh and Adonai. And just to boil that down, it means God is personal and God is powerful. That word Adonai, it's it's the word that's used that this is the powerful, sovereign, in control God. And the first time we see that in Scripture is in Genesis 15. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord God, Yahweh Adonai, you will give me What will you give me since I am childless? See, the sense of that when it's first used, Abraham is saying, you're you're the sovereign Lord, you're in control, and this is my situation. Can you step in? And will you step in? And maybe I could just say it this way. The sense of that phrase is, God is the boss. Now, some of you shudder even when I say that. I just don't like thinking of God as the boss. But he is sovereign. He is in control. And it is to him that ultimately we answer. 
You've probably seen that before. Two children playing together, one actually a little bit older than the other, and the older one is kind of taking control and telling the little one what to do. And, and for a while, the little one is doing it all, but then he has this thought, and he turns to that older one and says, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> and sometimes we live our lives like that. Nobody's the boss of us, and God, you're not the boss of us. But you know what? God is the boss of us. That's the sense of what he's saying. God, you are the boss of us. If you have the New International Version, that phrase or those two words are translated Sovereign Lord. The one that is absolutely in control of all, see, all things at all times. And we are to submit to him. And understand, as we think of the presence of evil, the sovereignty of God becomes very important. Because if we dismiss or minimize the sovereignty of God, that somehow he's not in control, that we have no confidence in the sovereignty of God, that God is not reigning all the time, then we're left with that sense that, well, evil runs rampant and God is oblivious to it. And the result of that is we do cower and we step back and we shrink away. So it is important that we understand and have confidence in the sovereignty of God that he is the boss. And you know what? That will become very evident one day in the future, won't it? In our home group, uh, uh, one of the couples used that phrase, in the end, God ultimately wins and he wins big. And we're a part of that and can even walk in that victory now. The, th the fourth thing he points out about Yahweh is that Yahweh is active. He says in verse 8, Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. And then he goes on for the next couple verses saying, Lord, would you intervene? Don't allow this to happen. May all these things that they devise for me become against them. Don't let them succeed. So not only is God sovereign, he recognizes that God is able to and will intercede in his world. God does always intervene. God did intervene in David's life in powerful ways, in purposeful ways. But let me just throw this out to you. Sometimes when God intervenes, it's covertly. Meaning you and I may not see it. And that's frustrating, isn't it? We want God to visibly do something about this situation that's in the world and in our lives personally. And we need to understand that sometimes God even intervened in David's situation in a covert way, not a visible way. And so that's where it becomes a matter of faith, right? A matter of trust. To trust that God will be active, that God will intervene, that God will act on behalf of his people even if it's behind the scenes not visible to us maybe not even visible to people i think of the first followers of jesus uh, they um, those first disciples they were under the power and control of a very evil government the roman government and when jesus steps on the scene what did they want jesus to do they wanted jesus to squash the government destroy those evil people and they were actually frustrated when he didn't but did jesus intervene he intervened in a very covert powerful way defeating the spiritual enemies by his coming bringing his kingdom so to say in through the back door God does intervene. In that evil situation in your life right now, he will intervene. But understand, you may not see it the way that you think it should be. So God's calling us to, be in, to walk in faith and confidence that he hears, that he knows, and that he's active. So we see this change of focus not focused on the evil that is certainly there or on the evil people, but a focus on Yahweh, on his attributes and his ability to.
to do something. And so as we get to the end of this psalm, because of this change of focus, we see that the psalmist makes three very confident statements that we end on today. So as we go to verse 12, it says, I know, do you hear the confidence there? I know the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name and the upright will dwell in your presence. Three statements of confidence. I know the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. He says that in a very confident way. He will come to the aid of, of the afflicted. He will represent the poor. And I'm wondering if David even writes that, that if he's putting himself in that category. Lord, I am the afflicted at this moment, and I am the poor at this moment. And sometimes we feel that way as well as the one that's being afflicted. Do we know for sure that God maintains the cause of the afflicted? Do you know that for sure? That was David's confidence. He knows that for sure. Is it sure in your mind? Is his justice perfect? Is his justice pure? Now as I ask those questions, no doubt all of us are saying, well, it doesn't seem like justice is taking place. As we look at our world, and some of you in your own personal lives, Lord, this feels very unjust. The reason we question that is because we think that the, the justice of God should be accomplished in our time and in our way. But perfect justice can only be brought about in the perfect time, amen? And in the perfect way. And I have long ago learned that my time is never God's time. And my ways and my ways of thinking fall far short of his ways and his ways of thinking. God does bring justice. God brings perfect justice at the perfect time. Psalm 89, 14 reminds us that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Justice is the foundation of the very throne of God. So we can depend on that then, amen? His throne stands because it is a just kingdom and he is a just king. So we can leave it with him then and not expect that he has to do it in our way and in our time. And I recognize that that is an act of faith on each one of our parts in our lives. He goes on to make another very confident statement. Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. So imagine that in the midst of this evil environment, in the midst of these evil people, what do the righteous do? Read it. What do they do? They give thanks to God. They give thanks to his name. Again, notice the focus. If we focus on the evil, then giving thanks becomes very difficult. But if we focus on the character of God, thanks becomes very natural. In the face of evil, in the presence of evil people, what do the righteous do? Say it. Give thanks. I love that example again of Shemsa last week. She faced evil. Evil invaded her life five years ago in the death of her husband. But she stands before us and does what? Gives thanks for God's goodness, for God's grace. There was an old Scottish preacher named Alexander White that was one of those annoying guys because he was always thankful. You ever have many people like that? He was just thankful for everything. And he would get up every Sunday morning to lead this, the people in prayer, and he would just thank God for all these things. And one time when the church got together, it was a miserable, cold, dreary morning, and one of the people said, certainly the preacher won't find anything to be thankful for on this miserable day. And so he gets up there and he says, God, we thank you that it's not always like this. 
Can't we at least do that? I'm, I'm thankful that it's not always like this, and it's not always going to be like this, and it's not always been like this, but this is a time that's <laughs> difficult. It will not always be like this, church. God is present with us, and one day we'll see his kingdom fully manifest, just as fully accomplished. Jesus was put to death by evil, self-willed men. But was there good in that act of evil? Boy, we got to get that. That wasn't some terrible tragedy perpetuated by evil men for their own good. It was the purpose and plan of God in that evil to bring about the salvation of all who would call on him. Surely the righteous will give thanks. And then he ends with, the upright will dwell in your presence. And that's our great hope, is it not? Certainly we do dwell with the Lord now, but there's a time when we look forward to when our presence with him will be face to face and we'll see him just as he is and he will be everything to us. We will dwell in his presence. You see, we need to think of this salvation that we have as kind of threefold, that, that Jesus has saved us from the penalty of our sin by taking the penalty for us. He delivers us from the power of that sin as he continues to work in our life. But one day he's going to deliver us from the very presence of sin. Amen? Amen. You looking forward to that? Maybe it's today. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So again, this psalmist turns his focus from the presence of that evil that around him and looks even off into the future and says, the righteous will dwell in your presence, both now and even more fully in the future. And I want to remind all of us today as we live in a country in which the government is, quote, shut down, the kingdom of God is never shut down. Amen? Amen. The kingdom of God is never lacking resources. The kingdom of God is not lacking for power. The kingdom of God is not in debt. The kingdom of God is never short of accomplishing its purposes. And the kingdom of God is never lacking in leadership. And we are privileged to be a part of what? The kingdom of God and the kingdom work of God. And we live in the kingdom of God now. We serve the kingdom of God, knowing that one day an angel is going to blow a trumpet and he is going to say, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. That's going to happen sometime in the future. All the governments of the world at that moment will be shut down. No longer open for business. And he will reign forever and ever. But until then, surely the righteous give thanks. Until then, we focus on Yahweh and his attributes and his personal relationship with us. And so I love how this lament really captures where our lives need to go. Yes, we we mourn the evil, we despise the evil, but we don't focus on the evil, but we turn to the Lord and we experience praise and confidence in Him. Kind of becomes an issue of what we focus on. My daughter recently started a wedding photography business, so I see more photos of weddings now than than I want to. (laughs) But she's actually very good, and one of the things that she seems to be able to do well, and any good photographer can do that, she can take a photo of, of, a, of an image that's very active, but focus everybody's attention on one place. And one photo I saw that she did, the, the wedding couple, the bride and groom were dancing, all these people around them, all this commotion around them, but all of that was kind of blurred and faint because the point of the photo is to see what? the bride and groom. And so in our lives, there's all this activity, all these people, some of them very evil, some intent on harming us, but we need to, by faith, turn our attention to to Christ and his relationship with us and his close relationship with us. 
because there's always going to be evil around us. But remember that he will always be with us. Amen. Father God, thank you for the truth presented in this text. Thank you for your presence with us. Lord, and I want to just pray for, for anybody here today that, Lord, you're still just a God up there. Would you just invade their hearts even now, even as we sing, so that you would be their God, that they would repent, they would turn to you, they would fall before you and, and acknowledge their need for you. Lord, would you do that work? And Lord, for all of us, refine our view of you. Lord, would you just from our, from our sight just eliminate that focus on evil and all those evil people. Lord, we want to see you and your goodness and your power and your purpose. So Lord, we just, again, sing these songs to you. You are our focus. Amen.